Just some quick news before we enter the haunted halls of Collinwood. In a follow-up to last year's successful performance of What Friends Do, Dark Shadows legends Catherine Lee Scott, David Selby, and Susan Sullivan will be appearing in a new play, In Your Corner, on Smartphone Theatre, June 11, 2023. Lifelong friends Bevy, Ruth, and Max share their broken hearts over the loss of Harry when they too recognize their own ticking clock, which comes with some startling trepidations and discoveries. Written by Susan Sullivan and directed by Asad Kalita, the play stars Susan Sullivan, Catherine Lee Scott, and David Selby. In your corner, will pull your heartstrings while challenging you to reach out and hug those you call family, no matter the distance. Watch the play on June 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on the Smartphone Theater YouTube page, which is at youtube.com slash smartphone theater. An alternate website is www.smartphonetheater.com, and I will provide links in the show notes. By way of a mysterious staircase in time, Julia Hoffman has come to the year 1840 from the present. She is posing as a member of the Collins family. Soon after her arrival, Julia opened the chained coffin, hoping desperately that Barnabas would be able to help her. But the Barnabas of 1840 looked upon her as a stranger and enemy. Since then, welcoming his newfound freedom, Barnabas has met a young woman named Roxanne Drew. He has made the decision to make Roxanne his bride in life after death. But on this night, Julia has thwarted his plans, and her actions will place her only in grave danger and will surely unleash new terror at Collinwood. to hide. This podcast is fun, but there are spoilers inside. Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. Tis I, Penny Dreadful, or is it Danielle? I don't know. It all blends together after a while. It's multiple personality disorder, darlings. Welcome, welcome. I am thrilled to be joined by my guests today. I have Amanda and Catherine and I am really excited uh, to have them here. Um, uh, I can't wait to talk about the 1840 storyline with them. So uh, let me give them an introduction here because these two are wonderful, wonderful fans and great people. Uh, Amanda Desiree is an author, frequent participant in Dark Shadows fan events, and is a member of the Horror Writers Association Los Angeles chapter. Amanda contributed to the book, The Physics of Dark Shadows, Time Travel, ESP, and the Laboratory. She wrote Smithy and Webster, which are books one and two in her Haunted House novel series, and also contributed to the CEA Greatest Anthology Written. In addition, Amanda has written Dark Shadows-themed stories, songs, and plays, and has publicly performed them. Catherine Creepy Cat Crestman is an author and storyteller. She wrote the nonfiction travel memoir, Creepy Cat's Macabre Travels, Prowling Around Haunted Towers, Crumbling Castles, and Ghoulish Graveyards, which is about destinations associated with macabre stories in history, literature, and film. She has also written the novella Lethal, as well as numerous short stories and horror nonfiction in anthologies and journals, including a piece in Running Home to Shadows. Catherine is a member of the Horror Writers Association, among many other organizations, and you can keep up with her at creepycatlayer.com. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my goodness. It's, a, it's great having you both here. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Catherine in person, uh, but Jim Beard from Running Home to Shadows told me a while back, he's like, oh, Catherine, creepy cat wants to wants to be on the show. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'd love to have her on the show. I, I really enjoyed your write-up in uh, Running Home to Shadows, uh, Catherine. Uh, and I enjoyed looking at your website and watched one of your YouTube uh, interviews recently, which was really cool. And Amanda, um, I haven't seen Amanda in forever, but I've known Amanda 
from online, from the Dark Shadows message board for quite a long time, the Dark Shadows forums. And we met, I don't remember what year, it was at a Dark Shadows festival. Uh, it was I, in 2006 in Brooklyn. 2006 in Brooklyn. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, it was, it was so great meeting you in person. Uh, and I met Midnight and I remember I was handing out those silly CDs and you told me you still had that CD. I was I like, oh. I work on it too. It's got all the Dark Shadows characters playing different instruments and the, the CD. <laughs> compilation of pop music that was inspired by dark shadows or dark shadows storylines which is a wonderful little trink uh little little uh keepsake to have thank you uh I, yeah i put together like that little mix cd of different songs that were inspired by dark shadows and i drew that silly cartoon uh album co i can't draw but i had fun drawing <laughs> i'll throw it up on the screen here i remember i remember handing one to jim pearson who was he was like it was the first time I ever, I I'd never met Jim Pearson, but he was like on the run, which he seems to always be like going from one place to another. But I was like, hey, Jim Pearson, nice to meet you. Have the CD. <laughs> he said, thank you. And then he just continued on on his, on his way. Um, but yeah, um, let's start with Amanda. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background with Dark Shadows? Like how, how did you first get into Dark Shadows and, uh, and, did Dark Shadows inspire you in any way to become a writer? I had always been drawn to the supernatural. I loved reading true ghost stories and stories about weird phenomena. Uh, my mother knew of my interests and she told me about this weird show she used to watch when she was a kid that she thought I would really like. It had vampires and ghosts and time travel, but it was on the sci-fi channel and our cable company didn't carry that. Um, so I, I heard about Dark Shadows before I ever saw it. And actually, the first time I ever set eyes on the series, it was an episode from 1840. Oh, we were on vacation in Northern California. Our hotel had Sci-Fi Channel. I wanted to see it because it had the Twilight Zone, which was my favorite series. But Dark Shadows came on first. I remember my mom pointing out the characters and telling me who she remembered. Oh, that's Quentin. Oh, I had such a crush on him. That's Angelique. She's Barnabas's wife. She's mean. And filling me in on who the people were. She didn't remember everybody. And it was a little unusual because we were in a totally different storyline apart from the core cast. But she remembered enough of the characters and their relationships. And years later, when I did get Sci-Fi Channel at home and I was following the series regularly, I recognized that episode when we eventually came around to 1840. That was about 2001 when I finally saw it again. And, and I could see it in context now. I understood it better. <laughs> so I, I, I really loved the time travel storylines the best. And 1795 was when I really began to connect with the series. I used to have it on the background when I would do my homework on the weekends instead. And over time, I found myself watching the screen more than I was looking at my paper, and I knew that that was when I was becoming an actual fan. I went to my first festival in Los Angeles in 2000. It was, it was such a gift to be around other fans because I didn't know anybody else, and I couldn't talk to anybody about the characters or the stories or my questions or make little jokes, and suddenly I was around my own kind, and yeah. I all well, that I could after that. Now, you also, uh, I remember you on the Dark Shadows forums as Professor Stokes uh, was your yeah. was your username on there. D uh, did you did you discover the online fandom at that time before you went to the festival or was the festival like your first introduction to Dark Shadows fandom? The festival was my first introduction. Later, I, I was on such a festival high for weeks after I, I wanted to get as much Dark Shadows as I could. And, and I'm, I'm kind of a technophobe. I, I really didn't have any interest in the internet until that time. Um, my mother found some Dark Shadow sites that she told me about. And I started out with the Sci-Fi Channel's message board, which which had- uh, I remember that. Episodes by by Robin V, Rob's Observations. It had some uh, comedic stories. Uh, eventually I found the Dark Shadows forums of the one that Midnight and Mysterious Benefactor run. It was an earlier incarnation on the ManageNet forum. That's where I began to connect with people. And by the time I attended my next festival in 2001 in New York, I could put names to faces and, and meet the real people that I'd been communicating with up to that point. Okay, wonderful. And Kathy, how, how about you? How What was your um, initial introduction uh, to Dark Shadows? And I, I see you you have a great interest in in the gothic and all all manner of spooky locations as you've traveled to was was dark shadows part of that uh inspiration for you or yes i i don't remember a time in my life where there wasn't dark shadows i don't remember a first episode i it was always there um 
I was probably in kindergarten and um, our whole family watched it together. And we, the Twilight Zone, Night Gallery, Outer Limits, Land of the Giants. Oh, all the good stuff. <laughs> and then the late night movies and the weekend hammer type films with the hosts. Um, we did that as a family. We went to the drive-in and saw Sinbad. And um, it just always been there for me. I just always grew up on horror. I've always been into history and literature as well. And then later I developed an interest in travel. And yes, Gothic is me. And um, so in my book, I have chapters on the Dark Shadows festivals, 2014 and 16, and the uh, mansions. And I've always dreamed of spooky mansions, secret rooms. I, I have a secret room in my bedroom. No one can see it but me. But it's been there as long as I can remember. <laughs> when you got into Dark Shadows, it was uh, during the original run, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Do you remember the first storyline that you did you do you have a memory of what you your the first storyline that you can recall watching on the show? Not at all because it it just seems like it's always been there. I would have been 5 um when I first saw it and it just was part of my upbringing, a, a daily supplement to my after school education. Now, you're you're both writers. Uh, was Dark Shadows uh, an influence uh, creatively in, in, in that regard? Direct influence. I, 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 I did sample some Dark Shadows references in my book. And, and uh, you had mentioned earlier my novel, Smithy, which is a haunted house story. The, the haunted house in question is actually a mansion in Newport, Rhode Island that, that <laughs> is uh, really similar to the one that we know of as Collinwood. Okay. Uh, but I'd always enjoy <laughs> telling stories and and that's one of the reasons I, I loved watching Dark Shadows because the stories were so intricate there were so many characters to follow and cliffhangers every episode it, it was thrilling and, and how about you Catherine yes as, as I said Creepy Cats Macabre Travels features the two Dark Shadows yeah. chapters and my first fiction was actually um, my, my gothic interior which is a Freudian pun um, about the secret rooms in my head it's a fan fiction uh, story about Quentin which got published in Retro Fan last year. Oh, you sent that to me. That was really cool. Uh, yeah, it was like a, a dream mm -hmm. sequence. Oh, it was really, really cool uh, uh, piece of fiction. Yeah, thanks for sending that my way. Um, I was in Quentin's arms. Yes. <laughs> it was great. Waltz Macabre. So. And then Angelique shows up. And it's like, uh-oh. <laughs> that's great no and amanda you also you were involved in the in the collinsport players as well right um in terms of being a performer and also writing and directing etc right yes uh, that that was a dream come true i saw the players perform at my first festival in 2000 they, they were so clever in, yeah. in the way that they they wove together Dark Shadows references into their own stories. I, I thought, wow, I'd love to do that. I, I had done a little bit of acting in elementary school. I went to performing arts school and and uh, eventually I did get an invitation to join. I did my first skit in 2003 in Brooklyn and I got to present my first script that I wrote at the 2008 festival in in uh, Burbank. Uh, awesome. It was a pilot zone Dark Shadows crossover I got to unite my two favorites what was I'm sorry can you repeat that it was dark shadows and what twilight zone you said a twilight zone, yes oh awesome yes, I, the story was that yeah. David Howard's like the blue movie character and it's a good life and he was using them to torment his his family in Victoria <laughs> I love it oh that's that's really cool I've seen um uh, some of the the Collinsport players on uh, skits on video that, um, but also uh, Dan Silvio used to print the scripts in Shadows of the Night, the Shadows of the Night fanzine, and I used to love reading those. Those were kind of a highlight because they were, like you said, they were really clever and a lot of fun. Just like kind of uh, loving parodies almost of their like. There's there's humor in, a lot of humor in them, but also like pulling directly from storylines and characters from the show. So that, those are really fun. I, I wish those would continue somehow, you know, uh, in, in some form, you know. Yes, yeah. Amanda sent me some links to some of those. I'm, I'm a late comer to the fandom and because, you know, I, I'm not an internet person and right. I didn't discover it um, early on. 
And um, Amanda's been sharing some of the history with me. And some of those um, skits are hilarious. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, Catherine, did you, were you, in, uh, did you subscribe to any of the, the fanzines or any of that during um, like the seventies and eighties when, uh, in the nineties, when the fanzine era was, was big? No, I wasn't aware of any of that. Um, I, I never really used the internet for fun. I, um, last computer I owned was DOS and it was around the end of the 20th century when I discovered there were some dark shadows things online and I found out about the conventions and a few years later I actually made the 2014 and 16 conventions and didn't realize there wouldn't be any more at first uh, yeah. no I haven't been aware of all of that before yeah. I started um I had rewatched some when it was on the sci-fi channel and then when uh the mpi started putting those videos out i collected every one of them and i still watch them every day oh wonderful yeah i yeah, i collected those videos too uh there were so many they took up so much space but they were really cool i have the dvds now and uh i love the dvds but the, the, there was something about the the vhs each one had the, its own you know cover and with the with, the, with an image on it and it was it was really quite an impressive collection of of tapes. I and one last thing you mentioned the end of the festivals in 2016. Every time I do one of these episodes and the festival comes up, people always express disappointment that there aren't any new festivals and uh, I'm hopeful that something will happen even if it isn't uh the Dark Shadows Festival specifically it would be great if somebody kind of started a new dark shadows convention you know uh and uh i know and I, some of the actors certainly have expressed an interest in attending even if it was just like a one-day thing maybe they could do like the actors come on the saturday and then sunday is all fan programming or something like that uh because i still think there's enough interest to sustain uh, uh even if it isn't every year maybe every other year a dark shadows event do you both feel that way or or am I an Absolutely. eternal optimist? Absolutely. Oh, no, I, I, I keep every year for something new. And I know that there have been other attempts uh, by other people to create offshoot conventions. Um, with the COVID restrictions, those didn't happen. I hope that the people who are trying to prepare those events will try to do that again now that we're able to mingle more freely. Um, and, and as much as I love seeing the actors, I've always loved interacting with the fans more. So even if it was just a fans get together and, and do skits and play trivia games and talk about the show, I would be there for it. Yeah. And with a dealer's room, just, you know, you could have pretty much everything. And I, I guarantee some of the, like when I interviewed uh, Lara Parker uh, on this podcast, I asked her if she would still do uh, a, a convention appearance for, for, the, for the dark shadows festival or ever came back and she said i'm still alive aren't i <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's a yes a yes <laughs> well she was up until 1840 anyways well yeah yes yeah <laughs> great, great segue by the way thank you for that so today we're going to be talking about the 1840 storyline which uh is the uh, not the last Dark Shadow storyline, because there's still 1841 parallel time after 1840, but 1840 is the final Dark Shadow storyline set in the main time band. And it's one of those storylines that did not air in syndication. So it was sort of the quest to see the final year of Dark Shadows, the, you know, the rest of, of parallel time, 1995, summer 1970, 1840, 1841, parallel time. So um, the way I first experienced 1840 was through the Dark Shadows concordance that Kathy Rush put out, uh, which was uh, a very in-depth uh, episode compilation, a summary of the of the episodes with great artwork by Warren Otson. And then I finally did get to see it when MPI put out the tapes, the aforementioned tapes here. 1840, I think it doesn't get as much love as 1795 or 1897, uh, but I think it's a compelling storyline, especially the first half of, of 1840, I think is really cool. The, a couple of big inspirations for, for 1840 come to mind. 1840, in many ways, has a I think is a pastiche of some of the 1795 stuff. You got some of the 1897 stuff. You got a lot of like, uh, I think uh, Steve Shutt uh, called it the, dark, the greatest hits of Dark Shadows. There's some, there are a lot of like bits and pieces that are familiar echoes from other storylines. But there's one 
big sort of core thing, and that's the head of Judah Zachary uh, aspect of the storyline that's brought into it. And a, a lot of the Dark Shadow storylines are inspired by classic literature. The head of Judah Zachary storyline is inspired very clearly is inspired by the thing that couldn't die, which is a 1958, I think, uh, universal horror B movie. Um, and I remember this being discussed in some fan group. It might have been the Dark Shadows forums where somebody put that out there, that this was this was the inspiration for the Judah Zachary, head of Judah Zachary. And somebody got kind of, you know, wrinkled their nose at that. And they said, well, well, no, Dark Shadows uses classic literature for inspiration. This is a cheap B movie like guess what it's all, all it's a warlock's head found in a box that takes possession of people in an effort to have them reunite his severed head with his body they even have a flashback scene where he has the blindfold on so that he can't because he has the evil eye and all of this kind of stuff so that's a, I think a big influence on that aspect of the storyline and then you see some some aspects also of black sunday especially in the crypt in judah zachary's crypt you see the the coffin you know with the with the opening there with the mask the mask of ball and the big cross that's meant to, to keep him trapped in there so there's um there's some black sunday stuff happening in there too and my guess is that dan curtis just was like saw the thing that couldn't die at some point and said, let's do that. That was, <laughs> I like that movie or something, you know, that's, that's my guess is Dan Curtis came in and just told the writers to do, to do that. Um, but there's a lot, there are a lot of other things happening in this uh, storyline. So before I dive into breaking, I'm going to just go through the plot line, which is so much stuff happening in this storyline. So I'll, we're going to be missing some things. I pulled it off the fandom wiki, but I'm going to just break it down into bits and pieces here. But before I dive into that, uh, I'd love to hear from both of you your just general opinions on the 1840 storyline. I think you you put it very succinctly when you said that it's a, a reel of Dark Shadows' greatest hits, or alternatively, you could say it's the reheated leftovers, depending on whether they sampled <laughs> you liked or not, or how well they presented it. Uh, I Again, I, I've always enjoyed the historical storylines. I like looking back at the, the previous members of the Collins family. And in 1840, we're close enough to 1895. 1795, pardon me, where we do see some characters return like Ben Stokes and Daniel Collins. Uh, so it's nice to have that connection, even though I, I didn't really care for the way those characters ended their time on the show. Yeah. Um, there, there was a lot going on. You mentioned the thing that couldn't die. And and as I happened to be watching the Dark Shadows reruns on Sci-Fi Channel, I was also watching Mystery Science Theater episodes on Sci-Fi Channel. Well, they covered the thing that couldn't die. So yeah. I, I saw that I was seeing the head of Judah Zachary and I, I made the same connection. Yeah. Um, it's actually not above the films that Mystery Science Theater usually covers. It, it, it's it's a lot of fun to watch. I do recommend it, especially if, if you're a Dark Chess fan and you want to compare where the source material came from. Um, I, I've always been rather neutral on 1840. There are stories that I love and stories that I despise. And, and I've always had a mixture of those feelings for 1840. There are things that I really like and things that I'm not too excited about. So we'll we'll cover those in general as we progress through the storyline summary. Okay. And how about you, Catherine? What are your general kind of overview thoughts on 1840? I am the stranger you spoke of, and I will love you as no one else ever has. I cannot help myself. I just, you know, I love dialogue like that. I, I love all of Dark Shadows, and I think 1840s are very rich. And how can you not just love everything when somebody talks like that? Yeah. Um, that's Barnabas to Roxanne. I mean, that's that's what it's all about for me. Beautiful dialogue. They have storylines that come and go and, and and intertwine. And this there are a lot of good stories in here. And I love all the characters. And I just find it very interesting. I like the way it ties in with the witch trial history. And I like the way it the, the, Roxanne is threaded through the different time periods. There, um, I'm just a fan of the 1840 storyline. I can't say I hate any of the stories, though. Same. Any of the storylines. Same here. Yeah, I I love all of the Dark Shadows storylines. Um, there are some I like more than others, but uh, I however happily watch any one of them. Uh, they're they're all there's always something to love in every Dark Shadows storyline, and uh, this one's really 
really compelling. Um, we got a lot of new characters who are introduced uh, in this storyline. Uh, really great characters too, and we'll, we'll talk about them here as we go through. Uh, and we, uh, as Amanda pointed out, we see some some uh, familiar characters, older versions of familiar characters returning. In many ways, this is a, a sequel to the 1795 storyline and kind of a prequel to the 1897 storyline. So uh, it's kind of kind of kind of cool to see that and see. Ben Stokes and Daniel, although I agree with what you said, Amanda, the way they uh, ended their lives is really sad. Like that's yeah. the that's the way Ben went out. No, um, but so that's, that's so dramatic, though. That's it really is. Really it is dramatic. Good idea. Yeah. So, so um, can I mention something about Black Sunday, though? Oh, please do. Can... Yes, absolutely. Um, you can talk about Black Sunday as much as you want. I, I love Black Sunday. Um, well, you know, it's funny that a couple of years ago, I was telling Amanda that, that I had this image burned into my brain from when I was a child of a black coach going across the landscape. And I was like, what movie was that from? And she said, Black Sunday. <laughs> and then I got the movie and it's like, by golly, that was it. Because that was seared into my brain as a child, that image. And it's just so fantastic. Um and it's a coincidence that we're talking about it today with Amanda when um, that's how I got reintroduced to it. And there were a couple other um, influences that I wanted to mention before we go too far into the oh, story. Please, please um, do. Yeah. Move over, darling. Doris Day movie. Doris Day is my favorite actress. Mm -hmm. And um, I at one time owned all her LPs and 78s. And Move Over, Darling is about a woman who is. Uh, lost on an island and or uh, her husband is and she marries again and he comes home and she has two husbands to choose between oh and that was Doris Day and um, James Garner and it was a remake of a movie with Cary Grant called My Favorite Wife so I think they they uh, stole that storyline from them and then the closet portal I I can't help but think of Rosemary's Baby every time they go into that linen closet oh right <laughs> the playroom yeah <laughs> and the, the, the one other influence I thought of was the woman in white, um, uh, all the all the notes being left all the time and this woman being cited. And um, she's also went to an asylum like Joanna Mills. And oh, um, right. yeah. Yeah, I just think that that's threaded through as well. Great. Thank you for, for adding those. And Dark Shadows definitely didn't only take from from uh horror stuff in terms of reworking things and using them in the, in their storylines i mean we we saw that with the manchurian candidate was used uh in, in 1897 and uh, uh for the burke devlin uh storyline there um count of monte cristo um uh, yeah so they they we're pulling from other things too. So I'm going to read the, the segment and then we can talk, just give our kind of our thoughts here. After escaping from the burning Collinwood, the stairway into time leads Dr. Julia Hoffman to Collinwood in the year, year 1840. Julia opens Barnabas Collins' coffin, but he does not recognize her and tries to kill her. The elderly Ben Stokes manages to stop him. Barnabas from 1970 soon arrives after using the I Ching to travel back in time to 1840 to take over his body's mind and rescue Julia. Together, they try to find a way to prevent the future destruction of Collinwood from happening. In this time frame, Gabriel Collins is the paraplegic heir to Collinwood and is married to Edith Collins, both of whom are trying to scam and secure the Car Collins wealth for themselves and leave everyone else out. Gabriel is secretly revealed, uh, well, this 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 is jumping ahead. Uh, Gabriel secretly uh, later secretly reveals that he can walk and is faking his handicap to his advantage. Barnabas in his vampire form bites and infects Roxanne Drew, who becomes a vampire and begins a spree of killings and attacks on Collinsport residence. Roxanne's older brother arrives in Collinsport, and after learning from Barnabas about Roxanne, he manages to stop her from entering her coffin during the daytime and lets the sunlight burn her to dust. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop it there. This, this synopsis comes from the dark shadows, uh, fandom wiki page. So it's kind of, it's pulling pieces and trying to condense them into little segments. And there is a lot of information to take in, in 1840. This first segment of 1840, uh, Julia arrives. Julia was always a very, uh, a key character in Dark Shadows, but I think starting around the Leviathan storyline, she really takes 
center stage in a lot of these storylines. As, as, uh, she, you know, because Barnabas has been kind of, you know, brainwashed by the Leviathan. So Julia becomes the key protagonist of the series here and and continues on in, in many ways. It's like you get this kind of Holmes and Watson kind of thing happening with Julia and Barnabas. And then we go into 1840 and Julia is the one who arrives first before Barnabas does. She meets Ben. It's great to see Ben Stokes uh, again, uh, an elderly bag. I guess he came back to Colin because Joshua told, gave him his, his freedom, but he must have returned at some point, probably of his own volition, maybe to help Daniel Collins, et cetera. And he's living at Collinwood with his granddaughter, Carrie Stokes. And um, we meet, I mean, the first characters we meet are, you know, we see Julia, I mean, she meets, uh, we see Carrie, we see Gabriel, Christopher Pennock in one of his greatest roles, perhaps his greatest role. I mean, he's just so absolutely, yeah, so acerbic and sarcastic, and and putting him in a wheelchair and just having him just throw a pity party for himself, but in <laughs> such a mean, spirited, nasty way. But but he has a charm to him. But he's 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 you know very very acerbic in his way. He he speaks and. Um, so we meet these, can we see Samantha, who's just, be just beautiful character out of a gothic novel. She's just, there's something very tragic about Samantha and how, uh, it's just the way she talks and her demeanor, et cetera. And this whole idea of Julia convincing, meeting Ben and convince Julia and Ben meeting, like, how cool is that? I mean, it's just great. Uh, and then Julia convincing Ben to let Barnabas out of his coffin because she thinks he used the I Ching to come back and he didn't. He's not, he does not recognize Julia at all. He's going to kill Julia. This is 1795 Barnabas when he got chained in his coffin. Uh, Barnabas starts preying on Roxanne. He wants to turn Roxanne into a vampire and she's let this predator basically, it was because it's tragic predator, but he's, you know, Barnabas is wants to kill Julia at this point. It's it's crazy. It's some crazy, there's some crazy stuff happening here. So can we talk a little bit about this opening sequence here in 1840? One of the things that was so surprising was how much the, the characters and the events differed from what I expected would happen. We had this whole lead up through the summer of, 18, of 1970 about how Gerard was a pirate and he was trying to take over Collinwood and that's never mentioned in nope. in this at all the children are not the focus of the 1840 storyline the way they were in the 1970 story it's, it's completely not what we thought we were going to get so the lack of expectations the uncertainty uh, was part of what made the storyline interesting but even the characters themselves were not what I expected when we see Edith Collins another of, of the first people that Julia spies on she's She's a shrew. She's not the the jolly, loving matriarch that we come to know in 1897. Evidently, she she softened up quite a bit um, because that that's not the Edith that I thought I was going to get. Um, even when Barnabas comes out of the coffin, at that point, he's been chained up for only 45 years. And I thought that he would be a little less aggressive. I, I could see him being that vicious in the 1960s when he's been incarcerated for over a century, but it hasn't been quite that long. I, I didn't think he was going to go quite so sour. Um, so that was also very interesting to see. Um, you had mentioned Gabriel and, and he, he is, I agree, he was Chris Pinnock's greatest character. I always hoped that the Big Finish Productions might do a, an audio drama about Gabriel and Clinton's childhoods to explore more of the enmity between them. There, there are allusions throughout 1840 to the accident that caused Gabriel's paralysis, so-called paralysis, and, and why he resents Clinton so much and how that causes him to take certain actions that he does throughout the storyline. I would like to know more about what made all that happen. Is it just the rivalry trying to get the, the majority of Daniel's assets, who's going to rule Collinwood when he dies, or is there more to it? Was was there more that went back to when they were younger? And and maybe Quentin's not the innocent victim that we thought he was. Maybe he, there's a good reason why Gabriel doesn't like him. So yeah, I think that was an opportunity. I agree. Yeah, I think that would have been great. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a great idea. Absolutely. Um, there's definitely some envy there and a desire for uh, 
you know, validation and approval from his father. And there's a great scene with Daniel and Gabriel. Uh, Christopher Pennock used to talk about that, how it was so, you know, he, reacting to Louis Edmonds and uh, as Daniel and how genuine that was, that, that it kind of, ele the scene was just elevated to, to another level um, because Gabriel was still, you know, a villain i uh, as he was he was an antagonist in the storyline but you kind of you felt for him at the same time too it was a really interesting really interesting character for, uh, for sure um uh catherine how about you what did you think of this whole I opening don't like gabriel at all i don't i mean he, he, certainly he wasn't treated right by his father um but that doesn't excuse his um, no no it, 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 playing um quentin like that all his life making him bear that guilt because yeah. quentin does have a conscience and um no i just there's no excuse for him he's rotten <laughs> he's he's rotten yes in my opinion <laughs> he was faking the entire time that in yeah, the wheelchair honestly, <laughs> i i don't care how his father or his mother treated him he's just no, he's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so how can you well, love a kid like that? What did you think of the whole um of uh Julia releasing Barnabas from from the coffin uh and Barnabas not knowing who Julia was? This is this is this is Barnabas 1795 Barnabas. This is not uh 1970 Barnabas yet at this point. I what did you think of that? I I I think that's um what I would expect Barnabas. He's got a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. Um and he's he's hungry too. So between the two, I would expect <laughs> him to attack anything that moved. Um Julia has not had time to think through a lot of things. The pace is moving way too fast for me. I I like the first year before Barnabas and when in the 1795 for the pace. Mm -hmm. I liked it when I could wallow in the emotions and it's moving so fast julia can't even think things through um she's if she had taken the time to think she would have realized that it might not be barnabas in there and ben did try to warn her but she just hasn't she's moving too fast to think things through so i yeah. feel bad a component i think because she 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 cares so much for barnabas she wouldn't want to leave him locked up any longer than she absolutely had to mm -hmm. and, and she did believe that he was right behind her yeah yeah uh, one of the one of the theories about why dark shadows ended up getting canceled was because it was moving so fast at this point that if you missed one episode you'd be completely lost uh and like Catherine said you know in the earlier uh storylines you know it, it was more of a slow burn like you could really kind of absorb things uh at a slower pace but by the time we get to 1840 it, it's true i mean if you missed the episode where julia let barnabas out of the coffin that one episode then you see barnabas you know he's he's out and he's wants to kill julia and he's he's more you know attacking roxanne etc it's what's happening uh i loved the when Barnabas sees Ben too for the first time after all those years, and he's Ben, how old? How old? He's shocked to see to see Ben. I thought that was really, that was really cool um, to see them uh, again uh, encountering each other. Um, so, and I mentioned Roxanne here getting turned into a vampire, but there's more to it than this, uh, and we'll get back to that a little bit because um, I, I like uh, vampire Roxanne uh, in 184. I thought that was that was really cool uh she, she was scary uh she definitely looked very ghoulish with her you know, with the makeup they did on her and stuff that's vampire makeup I mean, in some of the scenes i don't know if it's the contrast with her orange dress or the lighting but in some, in some scenes her skin actually looks blue or purple like like a yeah. corpse awesome. yeah. totally yeah yeah absolutely i like the fact that roxanne chooses her vampirism mm -hmm. and she also chooses barnabas again after angelique shows up she um she says you know it's my choice both times um right right yeah and ultimately actually it's it's angelique who opens reopens the wounds because when barnabas uses the i ching to and and inhabits his body in 1840 he's actually right on the verge of killing julian she pulls the cross on him and and he, he that's exactly good timing there with with the i ching because there was a flash forward to the present day where barnabas um where barnabas finds out that julia died in 1840 so he he 
use the I Ching and there are all kinds of issues here with I, I'm I might do a separate episode just kind of there are a lot of um I guess loopholes or or plot inconsistencies that that take place with 1840 that that are not really addressed yet. <laughs> more more than a few yeah uh but they, they get back to 1970 if Barnabas is no longer a vampire in 1840 and he, he's still going to be alive in 1970 right and and the body he was inhabiting in 1840 was the one that was locked in the coffin so if he walked up the time staircase in that body then he was never he didn't go back into the coffin for willie to find him in 1960 and so there there are a lot of weird things happening here and then what about barnabas and the I Ching? And what's that the paradox of roxanne too she's destroyed by by randall in 1840 so how did she yeah. get to 1970 right, to hook up right. With in, the, in the future yeah, yeah, there are there are all kinds of strange things in this storyline. Like Edith, for example, uh, she's killed off, so there's no Edith. There's, did Barnabas and Julia simply change history? So the events of 1897 were now altered because Edith Collins was killed by Gabriel, or uh, Warren Odson had a great theory, you know, that she because she made a pact with Gerard slash Judah that she came back you know, and then maybe repented at some point and went on to become the Edith that we knew. <laughs> we, you know, everybody talks about, you can see her breathing. So she might have survived the strangling. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. I hate to think that 1897 was altered so drastically. I mean, if we, if you take Edith out of the equation, that's a huge change to, to 1897. They, so yeah, they, If they'd gone on, they would have found an explanation for her being there. And she did have children at school. So yeah. I mean, the generation was already born and um and yeah there's there's no she wasn't buried in a grave she may have survived it could or they would have come up with another explanation if they carried the story yeah yeah i think they were just they were moved the last year of dark shadows they were i mean i think they were so burned out at that point too because they had been going for since 1966 you know they were at that point they had been going for for four years going into five years here and they also did house of dark shadows uh house of dark shadows movie they were already starting to plan the next dark shadows movie um which originally jonathan frid was going to be in and there was some tension going on there because jonathan frid didn't want to do it and dan curtis wanted jonathan frid to do it and meanwhile they're doing this daily storyline and you have gordon russell and sam hall carrying the load here and i think violet wells was ghost writing some of it but it was mostly you know 1840 was like it was mostly gordon and, and sam uh and i think i also think summer 1970 maybe wasn't as maybe the the ratings weren't as high as Dan Curtis wanted so they completely it seems like they completely changed gears as Amanda pointed out like everything with the children being a central focus the playroom Gerard which could have been a cause of David Hennessy not wanting to do the show anymore maybe so he wanted to regular high school and so if he wasn't available then you can't build the story around his character mm -hmm. maybe that's it maybe that's it maybe it was because I, David Hennessy of 1970 was very spooky you absolutely if you don't have david hennessy then you don't have the storyline yeah yeah because he is he uh tad is in 1840 you see him but it, it's there it's sparingly you know you see him one episode here and one episode there and he just quietly kind of disappears from from the storyline because david hennessy left the show at that point uh who knows if he would have come back maybe they would have renegotiated his contract or something if the if the show had continued past 1841 parallel time i like to think that that david hennessy would have would have come back if the show had continued into uh and back into the present day maybe they would have worked something out with him i don't know but yeah he <laughs> He left because of high school. He he was tired of acting. He wanted to have a more normal life. I, he he was such a central focus of so many storylines, David, that uh, it's hard to imagine Dark Shadows without David Collins. Like that just seems wouldn't be the definitely wouldn't be the same without David. But uh, th but he he left during this storyline. We lost some major people. We lost Catherine Lee Scott also during summer nineteen seventy. She's she's gone too, which was a huge you know, Dark Shadows 
person. I love her, but I've never forgiven her for that. For leaving the show, really? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Men come and go, but Dark Shadows yeah. stays forever. The, <laughs> that's another thing I had a d- difficult time swallowing. Like I love Roxanne, but Barnabas comes out of the coffin and he's ready to move on from Josette at this point and, and turn his attention to Roxanne. And Barnabas was, his thing was, he was always obsessed with Josette, you know? So I find that kind of, but there's no Josette lookalike there to kind of re rekindle that. I guess you could, could explain it that way. But. He comes across as very fickle mm. by Roxanne so quickly after he's released. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's ready to move on from from Josette, but that that doesn't seem very Barnabas like to me. But maybe you it was know, just I, a phase. I, I, love, <laughs> I love him for his devotion to Josette. Um, I just that's one of the reasons he, he's such such a great character, and then he shifts to Maggie after a while. After um, Victoria Winters is gone, and he he just didn't love with Maggie before. Uh, this time and then he all of a sudden is Roxanne when he meets her it's like the femme du jour and I, right. he, it's like in love with love since he doesn't have her bed anymore just he has mm-hmm. to have it. Quentin says the same thing I don't have a woman in my life at this time I'm old <laughs> I remember that yeah during summer 1970 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's like there's some the, the, a woman is necessary right a woman. although summer 1970 did that great um uh, I was talking with when I had Steve Shutt and Dave Wingrove on the podcast, we we're talking about the uh, beckoning fair one. And they kind of did that angle with Quentin and the ghost of Daphne and in, uh, in summer 1970. I thought that was, that was really kind of cool. But um, I, I liked when Daphne was sort of morally kind of ambiguous, like we're not sure. And then gradually we find out well, Daphne was actually nice but here she's she's said she's she wants to she's going to kill quentin because she's she's going to kill kill quentin collins in 1840 quentin the first because of uh you know, her sister uh jo- joanna mills you know he's he believe she believes that he's responsible for what for what happened to her but we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute but i'm going to read this next segment here Desmond Collins returns to Collinsport from a few years abroad with the disembodied head of Judas Zachary, a powerful warlock, to give to his cousin Quentin Collins I, who was presumed lost at sea and has now returned. Desmond discovers a secret cave in a graveyard containing a mask encrusted with jewels, along with Judah's decapitated body. Julia falls under the power of Judah. She is to join the head and the body. Judah's body is destroyed by a fire, and Julia is released from his power. Gerard Stiles, a friend of Quentin's, is forced to put the mask on, and Judah takes possession of him. Judah, posing as Gerard, plans to get revenge on the Collins family for his death. So I'm going to just throw some character character names out here for this little segment uh, I just brought up. We have Gerard Stiles. So we see Gerard, the living Gerard, before he becomes possessed by Judas Zachary. Um, and I, I, I felt uh, he, I, I w- he wasn't what I expected because Gerard seemed like such a malignant presence in 1995 and in summer 1970. And here, I mean, pre-possession, because we're, we'll, we will find out how he got to be that way. But um, he seemed, he was, a, he was certainly a scoundrel uh, Gerard was a scoundrel, but he was a charming scoundrel. Uh, def- definitely. I, What's that? Good natured con man. Good natured con man. Yeah, he was really fun. James Storm was really fun to watch as Gerard in, in, in 1840. Any any thoughts on, on him? Um, yeah, he's charming. Um, just the way he treats Letitia bothers me. Oh, bit. yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Agree. Oh. I always uh, wondered how how true his friendship with Quentin really was. He, he, he marries Samantha so quickly and, and you know, he only does it for the money, but does he ever, ever have any true loyalty to Quentin or is he always tagging along with him just to see what he can get out of the friendship? That's what I always wondered in the back of my mind. I, I, I think, think that's the way it is. I agree. I, I, and then he, you know, he wanted to get out of marrying samantha he didn't have to be so hard on her he's just not a nice guy as charming as he is he's not a nice guy no he's, he's not worse he's... than a con man i i don't think he he got i i don't think he came down too many degrees after he was possessed he was already bad <laughs> 
he yeah he, he, just, he just lost a lot of that charm <laughs> yeah all. and you find out he did he did a lot of bad things he there there was some there was they did throw a nod to the pirate thing as we find out his real name was ivan miller uh and he was actually you know uh had done all kinds of terrible things over the years and wanted in all these different places and he's using this name gerard styles um yeah i don't know how I agree. I don't know how genuine his uh, affection for Quentin is, um, but I don't think he's, I think he's bad, but not Judah Zachary. Judah Zachary is evil. Like, you know, I think, I guess if you use uh, Dungeons and Dragons terms, chaotic evil versus lawful evil, I guess, uh, if we're going to use, the, if we're going to get that, if we're going to get geeky about it. I guess this whole, this whole thing is geeky, but, um, but yeah, Ju Judah Zachary is, you know, this is a very dark force here that um, Gerard, Gerard's just kind of a, he's trying to scam people, gets, he's trying to take over Collinwood, basically he wants to, to be the master of Collinwood. Uh, we didn't talk much about, you, you brought up, I want to talk about Flora and Letitia too, because we're going to talk about a little bit about them at Rose Cottage. Um, actually, let's just, let's talk about them. You meant, you did bring up Letitia. Letitia, kind of the Pansy Fay 2.0, uh, Letitia Fay. I wonder if she's some kind of ancestor for for Pansy Fay, I mean, there's Cockney psychic person. I don't know any thoughts on. Uh, they never really established the connection there. Any feelings either way? It, it seems like that was what they were, which is a bit odd because if you remember, Pansy Fay was originally portrayed by another actress, Kay Fry, and, and when Pansy was killed, her spirit inhabited the character played by Nancy Barrett. So Nancy Barrett wasn't really mm -hmm. a Fay. And yet we have this this 2.0 version, as you said, potential ancestor who is in Nancy Barrett's image. So um, that was a loose connection that I don't think they thought through all the way. I, I, again, this this is one of the examples where I think they're just pulling out fan favorites. Oh, we have this this psychic from from England that everybody like. We'll, we'll we'll have Nancy Barrett play her, and yeah, and even with the the Letitia and Julia rebuilding Judah Zachary. That was obviously a, a reboot of the Adam storyline where Julia is yeah. in her building monsters again mm -hmm. yeah so I, I don't know how much of this was th that the writers were out of fresh ideas and they were recycling what came to mind or if they were honestly trying to bring in elements that they thought the fans would enjoy seeing again mm -hmm. um, but she had a different her characterization as Letitia was ev definitely evocative of Pansy but she had a I think she was a sweeter a little nicer I think I mean Pansy was a little bodier, I think, a little more, but she, she, uh, I think Letitia was, a, had a, more of a, a sweetness to her, but she was, she was fun. I really enjoyed Letitia. And I love that, uh, the scenes with Julia, you know, the, the Julia and Letitia under the power of Judah Zachary's head, Ju Julia was back in mad scientist mode and trying to reconnect the head to the, to the body of Judah Zachary and, already the, done that before she's done it before and she was using the lightning and down in the crypt with these wires attached to the mask of ball i was like just completely bananas idea and i <laughs> loved it <laughs> she was uh, i like the way she was teaching um letitia to be her lab assistant let me show you how to do this you can learn. yes i loved it i love that that was that was really fun uh it was really fun stuff going on here in the storyline i also loved um Joan Bennett as Flora Collins. I think she was having a great time playing that part because this was a very different character for Joan Bennett. Most of J Joan Bennett's characters were sort of very serious and, you know, uh, you know, majestic. And this Flora Collins is a, as a novelist, a gothic novelist who's kind of very flighty and giggling and, and just a really kind of a very different role for Joan Bennett. Uh, any thoughts on that? They take her um, for granted because she's so um, giggly, but she's very insightful. She's mm -hmm. um, a novelist who's observant and knows yes. human nature. And she catches on to things and she um, calls people on things that they're trying to hide or uh, they don't see. So there's more to her than giggles. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, Amanda. They, they do bring the character up toward the end of the storyline with with the trial, and and I I grieve that lost element of of her being more 
more daffy and more giggly. It was such a different turn for Joan Bennett. I, I, I don't like this character as much as some of Bennett's other characters, but I appreciate getting to see her do something completely different. Yeah, just interrupting here after the fact, there were so many characters in 1840 that we didn't really get around to sharing our thoughts on Desmond Collins, who was a major character in the storyline, played by the amazing John Carlin, who delivers such a unique performance in every character he plays. And Desmond was the son of Flora Collins, the cousin of Quentin Collins, Quentin and Gabriel Collins, and uh, Quentin's pal, his his best friend, uh, and knows what his cousin likes because he brings him the head of Judah Zachary from the Orient. Uh, but yeah, Desmond is a, a charming character, a really great performance by John Carlin, a unique performance compared to what he had played before with Willie Loomis and Carl Collins, uh, I guess a little closer to William Holland's head Loomis, but still quite, quite distinct from that as well. Great character. And it's interesting, one thing we didn't mention too, Desmond originally was going to be played by Roger Davis. That's who they wanted for Desmond originally. And Samantha Collins, I believe was, they wanted Catherine Lee Scott, or also considered for the part, from what I understand, was Marie Wallace. So it could have been either Catherine or Marie Wallace in that role. And Randall Drew was going to be played by Don Briscoe. That's who they wanted for for Randall Drew. And I would have really liked to have seen Randall as played by Don Briscoe. It would have been great to to get him back, but obviously that uh, that didn't happen. He ended up being played by Gene Lindsay, who did an admirable job in the role. Uh, kind of a sad character, I would say. He was kind of a kind of a, there's a sadness to him, uh, much like Samantha Collins. There is a sadness to Randall Drew. Um, but um, I would have liked to have seen what Don Briscoe would have done with that character. And also, no offense to Roger Davis, I am so happy that John Carlin played Desmond Collins because he was great. He was a great Desmond Collins. I can't really picture Roger Davis as Desmond Collins, to be quite honest with you. I can't picture that. But John Carlin absolutely nailed that character. Yeah. And how about... um. Daniel Collins. Louis Edmonds comes back to the show because Louis Edmonds had been uh, missing in action during summer 1970. Roger was in Europe, but now Louis Edmonds is back and he's an older version of Daniel Collins with some some state of advanced dementia. Or no, maybe not advanced, but he's, he's, he, I think he seems to have some kind of dementia. He's not, he's ill. He's not doing well. The character Daniel Collins, who we knew as a child and uh, 1795. Sad to see him in that state, but uh, great to see Daniel Collins, the character, back and also Louis Edmonds back and Shirley Edmonds playing him in the show. It was a shame to see what he had become. We learned that Daniel murdered his wife. So yeah, Harriet. Yeah. He, he didn't have a, a great upbringing after 1795. Uh, you just wonder where he went wrong. Um, yeah. Senses of him. And it, 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 it's, it's just unfortunate it's the, the way that he relates to Gabriel. We've talked about that before, that he's so harsh with his son. A good turn for Louis Edmonds. Just unfortunate to see the, the character devolve from the, the young white eyed boy who was going to be the, the new scion of the Collins family. I wonder if after experiencing all of the tragedy in 1795 that it affected him in that way made him made him that way and then he was raised subsequently by by joshua who was not the warmest yeah. person stepfather you know so i don't know but it's yeah daniel and even in 1897 edith says she hated daniel uh so maybe he went yeah went down a bad road there but it was great to see lewis edmonds back uh and playing that character um and with some memories when he sees angelique he knows who she is he he freaks out and she you know puts she puts a spell on that he'll see harriet collins his murdered wife anytime he starts to remember. although given the fact that he's he's got some dodgy memories i think if if he did tell people she's a witch and she was alive 60 years ago i don't think anybody would have believed him yeah, 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 because he because of the state he was in, you know, there. The other thing, too, is Daniel was supposed to have I presumably Joshua was, you know, we know the family secret was passed down to Edith by 1897. And yet when Daniel sees Barnabas, he thinks he's cousin Barnabas, who went off to England in 1795, but he doesn't. Nothing is mentioned about the secret uh, in the mausoleum. So. That that also raises some questions there, like where where did the family secret go? Any any theories? I'll throw that out there before we move on. 
I don't think he has that much dementia, though. I think mm -hmm. because he didn't get locked up till Quentin went to sea. Mm -hmm. And he tells very good stories about the Bedford atrocities, about right. 1787. And he, he recognizes Barnabas and Angelique immediately. He's easily convinced that he's mistaken. I think he's been told that so often that he submits but i don't think he's as demented as they as as samantha wants people to believe okay and yeah. he's released them immediately upon quentin's arrival and he acts pretty normal after another, a day or two good point good but, point yeah you're right yeah i don't know about the family secret though um because if he knew the family secret he wouldn't have said you, that about barnabas you look just as you did when i was a boy so maybe he didn't know the secret but Maybe, um, you know, uh, there must be some, maybe, I don't know, in the original run of events before Barnabas and Julie went back to 1840, maybe he found out somehow, maybe Joshua's ghost appeared and told him or something. And it... maybe he wrote it down in a volume that was lost and some later generation found it. Yeah, maybe so. I mean, there's, there's um, certainly there could be some explanation for that. Sure. So uh, Quentin shows an interest in Daphne Harwich whom he hires as governess to Tad Collins and Carrie Stokes, which prompts jealousy in his in his wife, Samantha. Both Quentin and Daphne begin to receive notes, which they suspect to be from Daphne's late sister, Joanna Mills, who was romantically involved with Quentin before her mental breakdown and death. They make several efforts to contact Joanna's ghost for answers, but receive no reply. Joanna Mills is later revealed to be alive, quote unquote, when she shows up at Collinwood to visit her sister Daphne, which prompts fear in Samantha because she supposedly murdered Joanna by pushing her off the cliff at Widow's Hill. Samantha is revealed to have sent the letters to Quentin and Daphne, having forged Joanna's handwriting to drive them apart. Joanna is revealed to be a revenant who has returned from the dead to kill Samantha to avenge her own death, which she accomplishes by the same way she pushes Samantha off Widow's Hill to her own death. We haven't talked too much about Quentin, Samantha, uh, Daphne, um, Joanna. Any any thoughts on these characters here and, and in this subplot here with the Joanna Mills stuff? Yeah. I, I enjoy seeing Joanna. I had no idea who the character was going to be. She's not anybody we get any inkling of in the 1970 lead up. Uh, so having an original story to follow was fun. Um, I always felt sorry for Samantha. She was so unhappy in her marriage. And and knowing how marriages traditionally unfolded, where they were often arranged, they were economic arrangements and not love arrangements. I really feel like she was trapped in this situation. And, and I don't blame her for the actions she took. She, she didn't have much going for her. And she was just trying to grab on to what little she could keep. Yeah. I agree. Um, Quentin has always been a scoundrel. For some reason he's a highly attractive scoundrel, uh, but he he just loves them and leaves them in in all his manifestations. And he supposedly loved Joanna for a while, and now he loves Daphne. Uh, but I don't I don't know how long that will last either. Uh, it just this is. Quentin is a man of his times. And it seems uh, Quentin Quentin the second inherited that trait from, from his great uncle here because uh yeah, he does he does do that. Now this version of Quentin is sort of a, a bit of an alchemist. It is interesting. Uh, you know, he's uh building the stairway through time, which he refers to as a, a, a metaphysical experiment. And he's interested in the occult, but also interested in sort of this esoteric kind of science and combining the two to, it's he's an it's an interesting twist on the quentin uh, I, I mean this isn't the same quentin from 1897 who was even much more of a scoundrel i think in 1890s this this version of quentin has has something else going on here with his laboratory and doing doing these uh these ex experiments that he wants to do and desmond brings him the head of Judah zachary because he knows he's interested in these kind of talismans apparently so um although quentin in 1897 was also you know dabbling in the occult etc i agree samantha is a, is a 
there's a sadness to her uh, and a new actress brought into the show too, Virginia Vestoff, who is also uh, one of the uh, Dark Shadows uh, cast members was in 1776. There are several Dark Shadows cast members in 1776 and she's okay. she's one of them. Yeah. She was Abigail. Was she Abigail Adams? I think. Yeah, I, lo I love that. Yeah. I love that play too. Oh, it's yes. great. Does it Quentin is the has the same interests. I mean, I, I do. I share those interests too. I like the weird and the occult, and I wouldn't mind if somebody brought me home the head of Judas Zachary as a souvenir. Desmond does say though he thought it was a reproduction though at first. Uh -huh. um, he didn't think it was a genuine head, and all the titles of the books. Um, when Qu when Desmond says decides not to give him the head, but. Oh, I brought you back books, and he's reading off these titles. I want to read all those books. So. Oh, totally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the, um, the Quentin one and Quentin two uh, share the same interest. They're one is graduated from metaphysics to the occult. To the occult, yeah. The same thing. And 1897 Quentin has more of a a sarcastic sense of humor. I think Quentin Quentin the first is not particularly humorous with the sort of. Right. The, the digs and the little one-liners and uh, or little comments aside uh, to to other characters, so the uh, per personalities are a little bit different. But yeah, they they definitely share some characteristics uh, for sure. Um, I kind of it's always weird that on Dark Shadows that every character David Selby played had to be named Quentin. I it would have been kind of cool if they called him like Charles or something like they did in uh, Night of Dark Shadows for the ancestor version. But what about Daphne? Thoughts on Daphne? She's boring in my opinion. <laughs> I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a fan of Kate Jackson. She doesn't, though in the 1841 parallel time, she's better. She mm -hmm. doesn't even, um, her, her voice is not very evocative. It's all flat declaiming, sounds the same no matter what, and her facial expressions, but they do improve by the time she gets to parallel time. But I just don't find the actress or the character very interesting. It, for Quentin's great love interest. What about you, uh, Amanda? I, I thought that she was interesting as an Avenger for her sister. Um, that yeah. that was the reason she came along. But again, the, the expectations that we were given in 1840 or in, in 1970 are not what we actually see unfold in 1840. Mm -hmm. um, so seeing her as a more vindictive character coming in to entrap Quentin, that was interesting. Once she becomes the governess, it, se it seems that... Uh, the Collins family has a habit of hiring governesses on flimsy qualifications. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I I agree. Um, yeah, I I liked I I think she was more interesting when she had uh a goal and she was, you know, she had an ulterior motive. And then there's this like, you know, Quentin and Daphne are attracted to each other, but then Gerard is is attracted to Daphne. Gerard slash Judy Judah is attracted to Daphne and become so is Desmond. And Desmond too, yeah. At one point, Desmond yeah. also. With uh, the newspaper, she she shuts him down pretty quickly. That was nice to see some spirit. Yeah, <laughs> but then it's like, why does why is Daph? I guess in the original run of events, Daphne Gerard must have succeeded in convincing, getting Daphne to join his coven or something. Because why why are are Daphne and Gerard linked as ghosts in the or Gerard slash Judah in the in the future so there must be in the original run of events things must have gone down in a in a bad way because he's trying to he keeps giving da at one point daphne keeps having these dreams you know about uh you know being in love with with gerard slash judah so let's let's move on here meanwhile angelique collins returns to collinwood with her gypsy companion laszlo where she discovers that barnabas is free and she blackmails him into posing as her husband Angelique introduces herself as Valerie Collins to the rest of the Collins family. After learning about Judah's severed head, Angelique remembers that her real name is Miranda Duval, a follower of Judah Zachary, who testified against him in a witch trial in 1692. Amadeus Collins was a judge at Judah's trial. He was con convicted and, and put a curse on the Collins family. The elderly Daniel Collins, the master of Collinwood, soon dies uh, after having an argument with Gabriel and in his will, leaves Gerard in control of the Collins fortune until Quentin and Samantha's son, Tad, is 21 years old. However, if Quentin is proven innocent of witchcraft, then the fortune will revert to him. 
Gabriel then decides to try to acquire the Collins family wealth, first by murdering Edith, and then holds Daphne captive. But the ghost of Daniel Collins appears and drives Gabriel to his own death by having him fall off a rampart at the Collinwood Tower to his death, thus saving the Collins family from further harm. Uh, we, Angelique hasn't been mentioned much until this point, but this is a Angelique is a hugely important character in this storyline. And in fact, if we look at 1795 as sort of the origin of Barnabas Collins and how he became a vampire, and we find out uh, in 1897 is kind of the origin of Quentin Collins. Here we get a look, a glimpse at Angelique's origin, uh, and we find out she was originally known as Miranda Duval. We have this flashback to the uh, 17th century. The trial of Judah Zachary and Miranda gives testimony against Judah to save herself as well to get out of to get out of because she would have been executed too. And she's in return for that she's given safe passage to the West Indies. Uh, well, she ends up in Martinique. And the, I think the prevailing fan theory is that Angelique is a reincarnation of Miranda Duval. Although in 1840, it's sort of implied that she just continued living on to. Um, and eventually became Angelique. But in 1795, we did hear uh, the Countess, Countess Natalie Dupre talks about knowing An Angelique as a child. So I think most fans believe she's a reincarnation. Uh, but it is interesting to see um, what they do with Angelique in this storyline. Some some really unexpected things happen with Angelique in this storyline and really cool things. This is you now uh, the, the blogger, um, Danny Horn. I did love how he described uh, this version of Angelique in 1840 as Angelique restored to factory settings, which, which <laughs> I love because this is 1795 Angelique. This this is not the Angelique who experienced life as Cassandra in 1897 and Leviathans. This is Angelique that we knew in 1795 who has not, as far as we know, has not experienced any of that. She doesn't seem to be aware of any future events so um she starts out doing some pretty bad stuff she's she's uh has roxanne uh prey on julia and hold her captive in this lighthouse she's um she does all kinds of terrible things but then when we see her find out you know judah zachary uh was the leader of this coven that she was part of and how she first became a witch uh it's kind of kind of kind of cool like you know it's an, an interesting backstory for the character any any thoughts on on this aspect of this storyline, yeah, I, I I like it, the sixteen ninety two connection. I also like the fact that Julia is in, filling her in about her incarnation as Cassandra, yeah. which has never happened now, because she was killed in eighteen forty, so she'll never be Cassandra. I I love the scene, you know, her death scene, where Barnabas says, "Oh, I loved you all along." But then I d dislike Barnabas for that because she's killed every member of his family, tortured them. <laughs> it's like, how could he love her? <laughs> uh, and I want to get to that. I want to. I want to discuss that because that's that's a key element here. That uh, a lot of fans are divided over this conclusion to to this storyline and the story between Barnabas and Angelique as well. Any thoughts generally here on Angelique here, Amanda? I have never liked the character Angelique. Mm -hmm. She's an juggernaut and she's caused so much destruction, as as Kathy said. Um, I, I didn't care for the implication that she had lived in Salem, had a past life, because it, it contradicted so much of what we knew from previous storylines, her upbringing as a child in Martinique, learning the ways of witchcraft, the fact that she had a bargain with Diabolos. Now we have Judah as the middleman who recruited her to the dark side throws in a lot of wrenches into the mechanism. But I I, I regret that she's on factory settings. I, I, I always cringe whenever I see Angelique show up, but I had finally reached a point with the Leviathan storyline where I could tolerate her because she had become an ally of sorts yeah. to Barnabas. And, and then we go back to 1840 and suddenly she's the villain again. And she's obsessed with burying Barnabas and keeping him by her side on a short leash. And I've seen that before. I, I would have preferred seeing her as a, a more sedate, uh, more of an ally, which she eventually becomes because they have to team up to fight Judah Zachary, the enemy of my enemy, becomes my friend. I, I, I thought that the the turnaround of Barnabas deciding he loved Angelique was absolutely ridiculous. And it also offended me because of all, all the destruction she had caused to all the people that he loved in the past. But but Barnabas, as Kathy alluded, he seems to like the idea of being in love and he seems to like being in love 
with the woman who's out of his reach, the mm -hmm. woman who doesn't want to be with him, the woman he can't have who's dead, Josette, or in this case, the woman who's about to die, Angelique. So okay. I didn't really put much stock in his declaration. I like Angelique best in the Leviathan when, but I think it's the influence of Sky Rumson. He's such a dreamboat. And um, I just think that while, while she was happily married to him before she discovered he was a Leviathan, she was <laughs> Uh, beautiful, chic, and um, everything she should be. I mean, this is the trajectory in Dark Shadows for all of the villains, the supernatural villains in the show. I mean, Barnabas, Quentin, and Angelique all sort of follow this path where even by 1897, by the toward the end of 1897, Angelique is helping Julia to give the injections to Barnabas. They're united against Count Patofi. And Angelique, even even earlier in 1897, she's sort of an outside figure, almost telling Barnabas, like, you know, you don't know how much you've already changed just by being here. She stops Laura from staking Barnabas and then in Leviathan. She's never fully announced. They, they, they're always kind of, they, she develops sort of into somewhat of an anti-hero, but then when she sees um, that Barnabas and Maggie Evans, Barnabas is a vampire again and you know, he's making eyes at Maggie Evans. She uses that old spell with the pitchfork on the hand and sends Quentin, has Quentin and Maggie fall in love. Uh, so Angelique is never really fully trustworthy, but she is does become more of an ally and it's kind of cool. Uh, and I would have liked to have seen that Angelique as well in 1840, like the Angelique who has experienced all of those things, uh, helping them against Judah Zachary and maybe having her own ulterior motives as Angelique always does, but it would have been cool to have her from the get-go be that Angelique. I, I agree. Um, as for them, Barnabas falling and uh, finally realizing that he loves Angelique, that this it is a hugely controversial thing. A lot of fans, as you both expressed, really dislike that. Hey, I'm interrupting again. I shared some thoughts about this a particular moment in Dark Shadows about Barnabas realizing that he loves Angelique. But what I said came out as this kind of incomprehensible word salad. So I put something a little more coherent together here to sort of encapsulate my thoughts about this. Um, this is a hugely controversial moment in Dark Shadows, probably the most controversial one. And I'd say most fans dislike it, though there are fans who like this idea a lot. So I want to take a closer look at this. Barnabas is unpredictable and driven by passion and impulse, much like Angelique herself. Um, one theory has it that Barnabas is holding on to the last person left from his life in the 18th century. And this is what he's feeling. Like This is the last shred of his life in 1795. Barnabas and Angelique, who are both now human, are the last two standing from um, from uh, 1795. And I think Patrick McCray uh, alluded to this in the day book Unbound and when he was on the podcast as well. Uh, so I tried to kind of sort through my feelings about this and give this some thought. So we have these two beings, finally both human again, who've done unspeakable damage to each other and sometimes inadvertently to those around them, sometimes on purpose to those around them, in this war of escalation between the two of them over the the centuries. Barnabas had a love affair with her, possibly told her he loved her at the time, and then fell in love with Josette, ditching her servant Angelique in the process. Angelique uses witchcraft to bend people to her will, makes Josette and Jeremiah fall in love, and no thought about who gets hurt or killed in the process. Angelique uses blackmail. Barnabas attempts to murder her. She curses him as a vampire. He strangles her to death. She comes back from the dead and shows Josette a vision of what she'll be like as a vampire and lures Sarah out into the cold, resulting in the deaths of the two people Barnabas loves most. And it goes on and on and on. In a way, they both made each other into who they became. It wasn't nice. For Barnabas to treat Angelique the way he did. I'm sure most would agree. I would hope everyone would agree with that. That wasn't nice uh, of Barnabas to do that. But she took it way, way overboard in terms of her response to that. Of course, 
And, and in doing so, she dragged him into the same vengeful mindset, into her own vengeful mindset. She made Barnabas the way he was. He made her the way she was, the two of them. Uh, so maybe Magda was right when she said, they deserve each other. And ultimately, it kind of comes full circle because despite everything that's happened between them, there was something positive between them to begin with. They were very attracted to each other. Maybe underneath all of that hatred and resentment that developed over the years because of the horrors that were unleashed in 1795, largely due to Angelique, granted, but there was something there to begin with. Uh, so while Josette and Barnabas was Barnabas's dream, uh, eventually twisted into an unhealthy, undead, albeit romantic, obsession, and while Julia and Barnabas is a dream for fans who feel for Julia's unrequited love, and while a few like the dynamic of Roxanne and Barnabas, it actually does make sense for the original number, yin and yang, of Barnabas and Angelique to come full circle in the end. Laura Parker herself thought it was silly and wouldn't have happened had Catherine Lee Scott remained with the show. And I don't personally love the idea of Barnabas realizing that he's in love with Angelique because that would never have lasted. Between those two together? Are you kidding me? That would have imploded within five minutes because guaranteed if the show had continued, Laura Parker would have come back as Angelique. Make no mistake. Okay, she died in 1840. Give me a break. Come on, she, she ran into Diabolos in the afterlife and he made her an offer she couldn't refuse. Barnabas returns to 1971. Bum, 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 Angelique. There she is. Now we can deal with this situation. And if eventually Catherine Lee Scott had returned to the show, you know what happens next. So it wouldn't have lasted. It's a crazy idea to have Barnabas declare his love for Angelique on the surface, but in a way, it makes sense. It kind of comes full circle and ties it back to the original passion they shared. Of course, it would have made more sense if this had been the Angelique who'd experienced 1968, 1897, and the Leviathan storyline, who had grown into something of an ally versus the 1840 original recipe Angelique, who does go down that same road. Eventually, she does perform a selfless act. She shows that she can be a good person. Yes, it, but it would have made more sense if it had been... Angelique we saw grow over the course of the series and Barnabas seeing that side of Angelique. I do love the romance of Barnabas and Josette. I do love that even though it's doomed. And let's face it, after Barnabas becomes a vampire, his love for Josette becomes twisted into this tragic, obsessive, romantic, but obsessive, unhealthy fixation. His obsession with Josette is tragic but very troubling as well. But I think if the supernatural had not been involved, if Barnabas had not become a vampire, if Angelique had not been a witch, I think Barnabas and Josette would have been a happily married couple, as they presumably were in 1841 parallel time until Barnabas died of old age. Um, there was a sweetness to both of them, though Barnabas had already seen and done some stuff in his travels, as we found out. He, he's seen some strange things and done some things. Uh, Josette was pampered, innocent, and a lot of people don't like that relationship when they actually got to see it. They like the idea of it when you actually get to see it. It's not the most exciting. They're not big fireworks between Barnabas and Josette when we actually see them in life, but I think they would have been a sweetly, happily married couple, and it is tragic that Barnabas lost that. It is very sad, and people yearn for that. And a lot of people yearn for Barnabas and Julia. Julia loves Barnabas. I think Barnabas loves Julia, but I don't think he loves her romantically. Anyway, ideally, I would have liked to have seen Barnabas and Angelique become allies and friends, maybe both realizing, okay, we can't be together. Too much has gone down, but we can be allies. I like the idea of them forgiving each other. Anyway, that's my two cents. Here, this one that Angelique represents the last part of his life, and she and she dies. Oh, it was a Lamar Trask. We we haven't even talked about Lamar Trask. There's so many characters and so much happening in this storyline. It's it's difficult to to cover all of it. But yes, very controversial decision there. I remember when I first heard about that. I again, these weren't in syndication at the time, so I was reading was my scrapbook Memories of Dark Shadows. And in fact, that was the first. It was like 80, 1986, and I found this book about Dark Shadows written by Catherine Lee Scott. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And when, but at the time when I found the book, I was watching Dark Shadows in syndication. It was it was in 1897. It was up to around Count Patofi part of 1897. So I read the little, the summary of the rest of the storyline, which I shouldn't have done because it 
spoiled some things, but that was my jaw hit the floor when I got to that part about Barnabas declaring his love for Angelique as she dies in his arms. I'm like, what? What? How? how? That's insane. Um, so share your thoughts, listeners. Uh, I, I, if you're watching the YouTube version of this, there is a video version of this. So if you want to comment on your feelings about this uh, one way or the other, uh, let us know what you think. Judah and Lamar Trask, an undertaker and son of the late Reverend Trask from 1795, suspect Barnabas might be a vampire. They find Ben's diary, which leads them to find the Reverend Trask skeleton in the basement of the old house. They learn that Barnabas was responsible for his death. Judah goes to the old house in the daytime with the intention of staking Barnabas. This is Judah, but it's Judah possessing Gerard. Um, however, he appears before Gerard slash Judah, unharmed by the daylight, is revealed that Angelique lifted the vampire curse from Barnabas and made him human once again. She claims she did it only for his love and no other reason. Okay, so this was one I had a, a difficult time swallowing too. Angelique is able to remove the curse. What? Uh, <laughs> but since when? Did she learn some new spell in the last 40 some years? Yeah, maybe so. Maybe she just gained in power over 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 the decades. Um, because this is this is Angelique after she has returned from the dead, apparently, because Barnabas strangled her and we saw she she was able to to return. So maybe Diablo sent her back. Maybe she she became more powerful, but yeah, she can take the curse off that's new i liked seeing a new trask i guess for jerry lacy that that you love everybody loves to hate the trask so we have the dour humorless undertaker <laughs> a son of reverend trask who's convinced that barnabas murdered his father and hey he's right barnabas did wall his father up uh cask of amontillado style uh so now he wants to turn the tables and wall barnabas up at this point the curse had been lifted so he gets walled up by lamar trask when the curse being lifted um she tried to do that in 1795 and she, she when couldn't. he was dying she was unsuccessful then and now it was so easy yeah uh, it's odd yeah this trask is um not as bad as his father. He's not just on a mission to be self-righteous, but he, he does want to avenge his father, find out what happened to him, which is reasonable. But I think then he starts after a little bit to act out of jealousy, which is when he goes into the unreasonable. Agreed. I like seeing the variation of Trask as an undertaker and not as a reverend, although making him a fanatical witch hunter later on as he's helping to prosecute Quentin and Desmond during the trial. So that he just ends up reenacting the same Trask character. He just doesn't have the Reverend in front of his name. And, and I thought that was a loss. Same, same as I said with Flora reverting back to type as the, the more sober matriarch, they, they made Lamar the crazy Trask again. Um, I, I would have liked to see him stay with the first characterization that he appeared in, even, even as a uh, Roxanne Souter, we didn't really talk about that aspect that that he was courting Roxanne before yeah. Barnabas shows up, and once she finds out that Barnabas is married, she's mm -hmm. more willing to entertain his suit, which which I I don't think it would have been a good match anyway, either way. Right. Um, but he at least he got to do a little bit more than he had in some of his previous roles. He was a much more sympathetic character until he got jealous, and then he started, um, you know, he set up Lorna Bell. Oh, and right. It, it, he he lost my sympathy at that point, but before that, when he was just worried about what happened to his father, um, I I liked him a little more, and mm -hmm. I I felt sorry for him, um, for his unrequited love, but once he got jealous of Barnabas, he he just became so cruel. Yeah, we also have um another little subplot happening here um, with uh, Jeremy Grimes. We meet Mordecai Grimes, another Thayer David character. Thayer David plays three characters in this storyline. He plays Ben Stokes, Mordecai Grimes, and Professor Stokes, who, who also comes down the staircase to help Barnabas and Julia. Uh, which is wild. Thayer David was amazing. I just it's just great that they gave three characters in one storyline over the course of four months. Um, so Mordecai Grimes, who's uh reminds me a bit of Abigail Collins. He has that kind of vibe who's suspicious, you know, pointing fingers of witchcraft with my my cattle and all this stuff. And he has a son, Mordecai Grimes, played by Tom Happer, another new actor introduced to the show, and they do um 
a subplot or like a little romance between Carrie Stokes and uh, uh, Jeremy Grimes. Um, and that never, not never, they, they start going down in that direction, but then it never really goes anywhere. I get after Mordecai is killed uh, and it's made to look Gerard slash Judah kills him and it's made to look like it was Quentin. Uh, and that doesn't work out with Jeremy and uh, Carrie. Any, any thoughts on that, on that little subplot at all? <laughs> I, I guess the, you just can't get too much of Thayer David. So as many characters oh, yeah. as I want to give him, that's fine with me. 100%. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and I really do like the, I'm, I'm very much into the Salem witch trials and, and witch history in general. Mm -hmm. um, I've done, I've published a, a number of pieces on witch trials and gone to Salem a dozen times researching the history. And I, I, I like that it becomes more personal with the Grimes characters. Uh, yeah and in the jailer's wife it's more personal than just all the framing business but when that it it's really cool how the story pro progresses so that after they frame desmond and quentin also all the rest of the collins has come under su suspicion it's it's a really nice rendering of how witch hunts start yeah, we even get an angry mob. Well, the sound of an angry mob outside Rose, Rose Cottage at one point, which was kind of kind of cool. Like, oh, there's angry yeah. mob going after the Collins family outside of Rose Cottage. <laughs> so I, I think that was well done. And the Grimes characters make it personal. Uh, Thayer's characterization of Mordecai is one of my favorites. He's only in one episode, but he's so memorable from his accent to his characterizations. Warning Jeremy not to go tomcatting around. Yes. <laughs> such a folksy way of, of behaving. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the, the Jeremy and Carrie romance, I, I didn't find it compelling personally. It seemed like they were trying to build up a, a Romeo and Juliet type story yes. where the had had been rivals of the Collinses. Um, and then the, the murder of, of Mordecai drove them apart. And, and I understand that there had been plans to bring Tom Happer back in when they believed that the show would continue on to the present day. So I see this as the introduction of his character and the attempt to make Carrie relevant somehow because they had given her a build up and then they weren't using her. Yeah, they did. As in, in uh, 1995 and summer 1970, you know, Carrie was this huge, you know, important part of this. Um, the children were murdered and their ghosts and and all of this. And we see don't see a whole lot of of Carrie or Tad really in in this storyline. And just and then yeah, uh, I think you're right there. Um, so moving on it was here kind of sad, the way they had her running from man to man in those couple episodes from <laughs> uh, it, it, it's like she did from desmond to gerard and then to um the grimes boy it's like she all of a sudden she just after a, a man she's can well, i think she's she's like, she's more like a teen crush when it comes to like characters like desmond and uh, Gerard and stuff it's more like a teen infatuation whereas with I think with Jeremy there was like a kind of a, a romance that was genuine more gen a little more genuine versus the other two where I think it was like 16 magazine you know <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, <laughs> that's true it's just that the pace is going so fast she's in these she's going in an episode or two from man to man to man and it's like it's because of the pace there's you have to fill in those blanks yourself sure yeah, um, yeah i i knew some people in high school who were like that i had a friend who had a different girlfriend every week so i i think it's credible yeah <laughs> <laughs> quentin is arrested and tried for witchcraft charles dawson a follower of judah zachary is the prosecutor in the case Desmond is Quentin's defense lawyer. Letitia Fay, a psychic friend of the eccentric writer Flora Collins, is forced to testify, where she reveals that Desmond brought the head of Judah to Collinsport for Quentin, which implicates Desmond in Quentin's witchcraft charge. The judges find them both guilty and sentence them to be beheaded. Judah punishes Angelique for her betrayal by taking away her powers, making her human again. She brings the head of Judah to Quentin and Desmond's execution, and explains that Gerard is possessed by Judah and the one responsible for everything happening. Desmond grabs a gun from one of the guards and shoots Gerard, killing him along with Judah. The head of Judah changes into a skull and the spell is broken. 
Quentin and Desmond are released and all charges are dropped. Barnabas realizes he loves Angelique and goes to tell her. However, Lamar arrives and shoots her dead after figuring out that she was a witch. Barnabas chases and stabs Lamar, who then stumbles into the parallel time room at Collinwood, where he soon dies from his stab wound in the alternate 1841. With their task accomplished, Barnabas and Julia, along with Professor Stokes, who, who also arrived from the future to assist them, use Quentin's stairway into time and arrive safely back at Collinwood in 1971. They meet with Elizabeth Collin Stoddard and find that everything is normal, David is alive, Collinwood still exists, Barnabas is human once again, and the Collins' destiny is saved. Roger Collins is giving a speech at the Historical Center, and Elizabeth chides them for being late. <laughs> She's picking up the speech for Roger to read at the uh, at the Historical Center. Back in 1841, Desmond destroys the stairway into time by smashing it with an axe to ensure that it can never be used again. And that ends not only 1840, but... It wraps up the main time band, the regular time band uh, of Dark Shadows, and we see those characters for the for the last time. Uh, that's that's the last time we're going to see Barnabas, Julia, Professor Stokes, Elizabeth, um, all of those characters. That's that's the goodbye for them, January nineteen seventy one. Uh, so we have uh, Charles Doss Dawson came into the story, another Humbert Allen Estrado character. This this is again kind of like an Evan Hanley two point big follower of Judah Zachary here and um he's um he's a lawyer but it's great seeing Humbert Allen Estrado no matter what role he's playing it's great to see him there and uh, we have this witch trial happening so echoes of 1795 and then Angelique Judah takes her powers away she brings the head to the trial and etc cetera, etc cetera, and this all wraps up uh, in other words so thoughts on all of this the, the witch trial and just kind of sort of the conclusion of the storyline and Professor Stokes, the one little, <laughs> he shows up and he doesn't do a whole lot, but I think they were setting something up for, with Professor Stokes there. I have a theory about that, but they, it doesn't really go anywhere. But any any thoughts on the conclusion of this storyline? Uh, speaking of Professor Stokes, I was so excited to see him show up in this timeline. I had high mm -hmm. hopes for him. I, I thought he might become the lawyer for Quentin and oh, Desmond. That so he's so smart. Cool. Couldn't he be the, their attorney? He knows everything. Uh, and I felt he was so underutilized. I think he's only in two episodes. Uh, but I do wonder if he was being brought in at this point with the intention of making him a bigger character. And then maybe Thayer got a day job doing a Broadway show and he couldn't be on as much as they had hoped. Or if they were seeding the possibility of making him a more focal character in later storylines, maybe bringing him in finally on The Secret and, and making him uh, the, the third amigo in Barnabas and Julia's adventures at Collinwood. Um, which I would have liked to see him become a bigger character because he's my favorite character and I, I want him to have as much screen time as possible. Um, with respect to the witch trial, the witch trial was pretty absurd in 1795. Now that we're incorporated as the United States, we have a constitution, we have rules against deta detainment and, and the Age of Enlightenment means that people were less likely to believe in witchcraft. It's even more absurd in 1840. And as I recall, the the one of the judges on the tribunal summarily dismisses the fact that the constitution prevents this type of trial from happening by saying, oh, well, we, we have a stature from before the constitution and that takes priority. Yeah. Really? How scary. <laughs> In Collinsport, so, anything is possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Desmond says that the witch trial laws from colonial Massachusetts were carried over into United States, Maine. Yeah. Yeah. And I could see. Oh, Which it, wasn't, there was no Maine in 1840 yet. That was uh, a, a result of the compromise. So they're still in the state, state of Massachusetts at this point. Hmm. Aren't they? I, I, I'd have to double check that. Okay. I just double checked. And while Maine was at one time part of Massachusetts, it became its own state in 1820, becoming the 23rd state admitted to the United States of America although its northern borders were not finalized until 1842. Oh, but Desmond does make the point that the colonial laws were carried over to the yeah. state. He does He does say that. I, I don't mean, know if that's historically accurate, but that's what he says. I mean, it is, uh, I've, I've seen this mentioned before too, I mean, it is the idea of a witch trial happening in 1840 is, in America is wild, but... The last witch trial that's... in America took place in 1892. Did it really? I didn't it, know that. Yeah. 
woman who was suffering ill health blamed her um, Christian science advisor. Which state was it? Massachusetts. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> my my yeah. home state. It, that's, it, the case that's, how, that's how we roll was, here. <laughs> the case was dismissed, but there was a trial in 1892. Wow. I did not know that. There were some trials in the 20th century, but it was based on the idea that fortune tellers were were performing acts of of dishonesty they they were hoaxing their clients and mm -hmm. anybody who was pretending to be a fortune teller or a psychic was performing witchcraft in an effort to dupe their clientele uh -huh. uh, not that they were actually witches but that they were pretending to have abilities that didn't yeah. exist and, and they were committing crimes in that way i would hope the sentencing uh would not involve beheading however for any <laughs> of this, as seems to be the case uh, in this witch trial, where if you're found guilty, you're off with your head. My feeling has always been like Collinsport is, is this isolated, weird little town. They they kind of, they may do, they do their own thing in, in Collinsport. They could kind of see something like that happening, uh, happening there. I don't know. Laura came from, all kinds of crazy things happened in Phoenix before Laura came to uh -huh. Collinsport. It's not just isolated. Okay, so the witch trial wraps up. Angelique brings the head. Desmond grabs the gun, shoots Gerard, who then the head, you know, turns into a skull. Uh, and Gerard says some final words to Quentin, apologizing for, for all of this. He has some final words there. Um, and then with Professor Stokes showing up there, I love Professor Stokes too. He's wonderful. Um and I, I I agree with you. I think they were setting up him up to be a major player in 1840 and in subsequent storylines too. My feeling is just from behind the scenes stuff going on, this was around the time when they were prepping for Night of Dark Shadows and the script and all of this. And Jonathan Frid did not want to do Night of Dark Shadows, and Dan Curtis was not happy with that. As we saw in the Jonathan Frid documentary, he fired uh, Jonathan Frid at this point. Although this ultimately that didn't happen, Jonathan's agent was like, "You, yeah, you can't do that. He's to finish his contract." So I have this feeling. This is just a theory that Dan Curtis was kind of pushing. So, well, let's let's put Barnabas more on the back burner and bring in somebody else to take the help Julia with figuring out this Judah Zachary situation and thus they brought Professor Stokes in but then things resolved themselves and Barnabas came back into the forefront and became the lawyer for for uh Quentin and Desmond and Professor Stokes then got kind of pushed on the back burner and he they brought him back to explain what parallel time was because they start seeing the parallel time room again into 1841 parallel time to set up the next storyline. But I have a feeling you're right. I think they were setting Stokes up to be a major player uh, to to help wrap up this storyline. Who knows, though, that all of that stuff is lost to time. It would be great to, to know what exactly took place there. Any thoughts about our last visit to the present day in 1971, that little scene with Elizabeth? I think that would have been the new Collins family for um, going forward. If it hadn't ended, um, that that was our new base mm -hmm. cast. I always feel sad when I see that part of the show because uh, it's the la it is the last time we see those characters. So, um, some people say, "Well, that's that feels like the end of Dark Shadows because it's the," you know, but there it isn't, and we have another storyline coming up with eighteen forty one parallel time. But it is the last time we see all these characters that we really have been with all this time. So. The present day segments are my favorite because I mm -hmm. like the college family. Yeah, agreed. I, I I mean, well, I love all of, I love I love all those storylines, but it is but the the that you always come back to them. You want to come back to them and see what they're doing. You know what's going on with Elizabeth and Roger and Carolyn and David. Like what what's happening in the present day and uh, Barnabas and Julia doing their thing. And um, absolutely, it, I always found it strange that eighteen forty one parallel time didn't have one of our core characters from the main time band in it to anchor it like one of our characters would go and I say our characters from the main time band going into 1841 parallel time it just feels almost like a dark shadow spin-off it's such an odd ending to it's cool I like 1841 parallel time I think I love the 
Wuthering Heights meets the lottery craziness that they have going on there. I do too. These things we're trying to guess about why some of the major characters weren't pulled into 1841 what? parallel time. The writers ever say that? No, and I don't, I don't, not that I'm aware of. So closing thoughts on 1840, final, final thoughts here on this storyline, overall impressions or closing thoughts on this in comparison to other storylines, anything you want to add? I enjoyed the characters of 1840. I thought we saw more nuance and more complexity in some of the characters like Samantha, Gabriel. Um, the storyline didn't hold my attention as much because so much of it was a retread of previous stories. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's an overall an interesting combination. I enjoy watching it. Awesome. Catherine? I, I found it very interesting. I don't mind the retread. I When I get to one end of the Dark Shadows, I start with the first episode again. <laughs> I keep watching it over and over, so I don't mind that a bit. I, I found it I found it very satisfying. Very satisfying. I, all right. I I enjoyed it a lot too. Um, I uh, I preferred the first half of it to the second. No, I mean I like the second half of eighteen forty two, but I the first half of eighteen forty is so much fun and just just wild. Some of the things that they're doing, like just like things like that. The the headless body of Judah Zachary wandering wandering around the countryside. It's just like. Just crazy, wild, cool stuff that they, they did um, and just very vivid characters that they introduced into the storyline. Um, really interesting relationships. Um, it it was, and just cool ideas, uh, just really cool ideas. Uh, I do think it got bogged down a bit in the witch trial. I think they, that, that lasted a little longer, I think, than I would have liked. Um, I, but... It, overall, I think it was. It's an. Un, I think it's an underrated storyline. A lot. It doesn't get a lot of attention compared to 1795 or 1897, but um, I think it's it's well worth watching, and it's it's a lot of things to enjoy about it for sure. Well, um, I want to thank you both for taking the time to sit down with me today with for this chat or this evening for this chat about 1840. What can we expect from you in the future? I know you're both. Writers, uh, do we do we have any exciting things coming up from either one of you or appearances or anything like that? Well, at the Horror Writers uh, StokerCon convention, I'll be reading a paper on cats in the occult, a canthropology at the Ann Radcliffe academic portion of it. It looks at how cats suffer today from their historical association with witches. Mm -hmm. And I have a anthology called the weird cat which i'm co-editing with st joshi oh. coming up in um it'll be coming out within at the end of the year beginning of next year um with very some very famous writers living and dead contributing to it very cool amanda do you have any anything coming up i i have another book that's coming out in october october 24th release and i'm always shopping around for a, a new publisher for my next manuscript oh wonderful when that will be and where that will be all right wow well i will definitely put links to both. her great fans she's a fantastic novelist yeah uh i i will put links to both of your uh amazon pages um because i saw uh your your books on amazon and also to Catherine's website uh as well so you can keep up with uh, what she's doing with her appearances and, and articles and books uh, and uh, really exciting stuff. So thank you for, for sharing that. And uh, I look forward to seeing more from both of you. And I hope we get to hang out soon. Uh, hopefully, Amanda, I hope I'll see you in October. And Catherine, I hope we, we cross awesome. paths in person at some point. Thank you again to both of you. And um, thank you. It's a pleasure yes. talking dark shadows with you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and thank you for listening to Terror at Collinwood. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast through your favorite podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, or YouTube. Uh, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please like and comment on the video. Give us your thoughts on 1840. Did you like it? Dislike it? What were your favorite things about it? Let us know. And thank you again for listening. Thank you. And for as long as they lived... The dark shadows never truly vanished, for there will always be terror at Collinwood.
Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production.